Tonight's video is the on the hardcore mathematics behind thin film interference. So we talked about thin film interference in class and hopefully got at least as far as this slide. The idea is that you have light that comes in and hits a film on top of another surface. So we've got like gasoline on top of water. And that film causes the light to refract because you've changed from one medium to another and therefore causes a difference in the path between the light that simply reflects, so some light reflects, and some has to go through the surface and then bounce back. So it has to travel this distance to one side of the surface and then back. One of the first mathematical things we can talk about is if we think back to the index of refraction equation that I gave you, n equals c over v, where c is the speed of light in a vacuum and v is the speed of a given material, speed of light in a, a certain material, like gasoline or water. It'll be different than the speed of light in a vacuum. We can then solve that equation for v, the speed of light in the material, and we get this. So if you wanted to know the speed of light inside the thin film, you would just take the speed of light in a vacuum and divide it by the film's index of refraction, n. From that, if we sub in the wave speed equation to both parts, so let's say v, this is the speed in the thin film, and let's call everything in the thin film, we'll give it the subscript n. So lambda n times the frequency. And by the way, the frequency of a wave doesn't change. It's dependent on its source, so frequency will stay the same. That will what whoever started that wave waving up and down will keep it waving at the same frequency no matter what. So then sub in for light, so wavelength of light in a vacuum, times its frequency, divided by n. We can then cancel those frequencies, and we're left with this equation. So if you want to know the wavelength in the thin film, you just divide the wavelength of the light in a vacuum, which will be depend on the color of light we're talking about. So like green would have one wavelength in a vacuum, red would have a different wavelength in a vacuum. So this is not something that you could just automatically know, even though you can automatically know the speed of light. Um, you have to know this from a problem or from a situation. But you take the original wavelength in a vacuum, divide it by the index of refraction, and you have the new wavelength in the medium. And since the wavelength changed, that actually means we could change the color of the light with a thin film, which you got to see when I passed one around in class. There are some really interesting mathematical ideas that come out of the way a thin film works. And rather than just give them to you, I'm actually going to develop them through this example. So let's look. A glass lens of n equals 1.5, so that's its index of refraction, is coated with a thin film of magnesium fluoride, and that should have actually been written, the computer has trouble with subscripts, m little g f little 2. So coated with magnesium fluoride, which has a n equals 1.38, to reduce reflection. So this is like what they put on people's glasses to kind of reduce glare. Find the minimum thickness of the coating to eliminate the reflection at 550 nanometers, which would actually be green, if you remember from that chart I showed you over the weekend. The middle of the visible light spectrum at normal incidence. I've drawn over here at the right the kind of situation described. So we have air, magnesium fluoride, and glass. What's going to happen is light is going to come in at normal incidence, that means at a right angle, so I've drawn that here, we've got light coming in at a right angle, and some of that light will reflect right off at the first surface, some of it will go through. I'm going to pretend there's an angle, there's not, but I'm going to pretend there's an angle just to make this easier to draw and get less, it'll get less confusing. So first, we'll have light that comes in and hits the surface. What will happen is some of that light will simply reflect off and bounce back. If the index of refraction of the second substance, so in this case the magne magnesium fluoride, air would have been our first substance, is bigger than the index ref of refraction of the first surface, so magnesium fluoride according to our problem is n equals 1.38, and air is about n equals 1, so approximately n equals 1, which means that the index of refraction refraction for magnesium fluoride is bigger than air. When that's the case, we have basically fixed in reflection. Now if you don't remember, let's say we have a wave coming in, or a pulse coming in, that has a hump upward, and it hits a fixed end. 
So this would be before the reflection wave coming in this way. When you get a fixed end reflection, that wave is reflected flipped upside down. It's called a 180 degree or pi phase shift because the wave flipped over. So you can think about it being rotated 180 degrees. And if the incident and reflected wave were then meet each other, we'd have a crest and a trough meeting, and we'd have destructive interference. Just to kind of review the ideas of reflection and interference, because those are going to come into play in a little bit. Some of those waves, though, won't reflect. Instead, they'll refract, and remember, refraction is just passing from one medium to another. So they'll refract into the second medium. And then, some of those waves that come through will reflect back and then refract back out into the original medium. Some of the waves that come out will be in phase with the original, meaning that they will be kind of the same shape. And some will be out of phase, which means they will be a different shape, just like these two here are out of phase. They would interfere destructively. If they were in phase, they would interfere constructively, which is what happens, by the way, if we have free end reflection. So in free end reflection, where your rope is fixed to something that can move, maybe like a little ring stand where you've got a ring here and now it can move up and down on the ring stand, it would reflect back in phase with the original, meaning turned the same way. So zero phase shift. Coming out of this little interaction that I've drawn right here, we'll get both kinds of interference. We'll get some that are in phase and some that are out of phase. Because we'll actually get different wavelengths, different colors, different frequencies coming out of this interaction that happens here. Because some will be refracted, some will be reflected, and then they all come out and combine. The way we determine which ones will reflect and which ones will refract is actually pretty simple. And for this I'm going to draw two waves of different colors. A red one, which I have so far used to represent my original wave. So let's say it has a wavelength lambda. And then I'm going to redraw this original wave as carefully as I can so we can talk about some things that happen as we get reflection and refraction. Okay, so remember, I'm basically zooming in this situation here with my red and blue waves, so I've carefully kind of color-coded. The blue wave had to pass through this film. And let's say our film has some thickness, which we will call T. Okay? So if the blue wave went in and back out, as shown in kind of my circle place here, that means that the blue wave traveled a distance 2t further than the red wave. So the red wave just bounces off, as shown here. But the blue wave has to travel further. So the blue wave travels some distance 2t. So it traveled 2t. There's some things that can happen. Let's say as it traveled 2t, that path difference means it got shifted over a little bit from our original wave. Let's first say that it got shifted by half a wavelength. So notice that the path difference I put here would be half a wavelength. If it gets shifted over half a wavelength, you now have a crest and a trough meeting. You can see it right here. Which means we would get destructive interference. Destructive. But then there's a second situation. What if that wave got shifted over a full wavelength? here. Now that is shifted lambda. Well now we have a crest and a crest meeting and a trough and a trough meeting, which means that shift of one wavelength gives us constructive interference. And we could do it again. If our wave now got shifted one and a half wavelengths, so one and a half, we would now have another crest plus trough, and we get destructive again. And if we continued this pattern out forever, we would actually find something particular to be true. 
we would find this equation. We would find that every time we go through that path difference of 2t, remember all the way through that film, every full wavelength shift of 1, 2, 3 gives us constructive interference, or also a zero phase shift, so just kind of maybe bouncing off, not shifting at all. We'd get constructive interference because our crests would match our crests. So every whole number and zero um, shift would give us constructive interference. Every half wavelength shift would give us destructive interference. And that's exactly what this, prop, this equation says. We know we're going to go through 2t. That's the path difference between my original and my refracted wave. And if 2t is a full lambda, 1, 2, or 3, we get constructive interference. If 2t is a half lambda, 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, we get destructive interference. So this equation looks kind of strange, but it's just telling you exactly what happens. It lets you know when there's constructive interference, when there's destructive. The only tricky part, by the way, is that the wavelength is inside the thin film in the new medium. So what I was earlier calling lambda n, the new one. So keep that in mind. It's not your original wavelength. So not the original wavelength, only the new one. Okay, so now we're ready to finish out this problem. We'll use 2t equals m lambda. n. Remember, it's the new lambda. So I want to eliminate reflection at 550 nanometers. That means I want to take the 550 nanometer light that came in, lambda, and eliminate it with my new lambda n that comes out. And I want the thickness that I need to do that. So first, let's solve for the thickness real fast. We'll get t equals m lambda n over 2. And if we want the minimum thickness, we're going to go with the smallest m. So you'll think about that, smallest m, because there are an infinite number of half wavelengths we could do. 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, up to infinity 0.5. So I know that m is going to equal 0 0.5 because that's the first destructive and m equals 0 would be the first constructive or m equals 1. For that you kind of have to play around. If you put in 0 and get a thickness of 0 out you know that doesn't work so you might have to put in 1 and get a thickness out because if we're saying that it would reflect at no zero thickness we don't actually have films with zero thickness. Those don't exist. Everything has a thickness. But anyway this is what we got so far. Now what you're going to be tempted to do is plug in the 550 nanometers because um, a lot of you kind of carry over that, that thought from your math classes where it's like, oh, it gives me the number in the problem, that must be the one I use. But this is lambda. This is not lambda n. We have to use the new wavelength, the wavelength inside the medium, inside this thin film here. So you've got to think back to what I showed you earlier, that lambda n, the new lambda, equals the original lambda divided by n. This could be tricky because I don't think on the AP formula sheet that they denote that this is lambda n. You just have to remember it. So it says lambda, I think, on the AP formula sheet, but you've got to remember it's the new lambda. So we've got to find our new lambda. So our new lambda is equal to the original, 550 nanometers, divided by the index of refraction of the new medium, the thin film, 1.38. So my new lambda is I'm going to round this off to 399 nanometers. Now I'm ready to actually solve the problem. So the thickness of the film is equal to 0 0.5 times 399 nanometers, my new lambda, divided by 2. And when I do that, I get, and I'm going to round this off again, I get T is about 100 nanometers. So that thin film on top of the glass is 100 nanometers. Pretty small.